Jesus, of course, addresses this question in, in uh, the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and the Pharisees ask him if it's lawful to divorce your wife. He says, no. And they say, well, then why did Moses allow us to write a certificate of divorce? And he says, because of your hardness of heart, which is interesting because that suggests that, uh, you know, it's one way of Jesus uh, identifying the kind of built-in obsolescence of the Mosaic Law, that the Mosaic Law was not a perfect description of righteousness, um, but included concessions to human weakness. And we, that you can kind of run away with that topic, and it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, but he says, wasn't this way from the beginning? Wasn't this way from the beginning? Because um, God made a male and female and said, you know, be fruitful and multiply. What God has joined together, let man not separate. And, um, and of course, you know, the disciples hear this and say, this is the case between a man and a woman. It's better not to marry. And, and Christ says, uh, well, whoever can accept this. Not everyone can accept this, but only, you know, him to whom it's given. And uh, in a similar text later on, he says, um, well, he says this, the same idea that, uh, you know, what's impossible with man is, is possible with God. And, and so here's a, an intimation of the idea of sacramental grace uh, coming to bear on, on Christian marriage to enable those arduous goods that were impossible under the old law because we lacked the grace to cooperate um, and to actually obey and share everything that God desires for us. So this is, the, this is not the only argument. But this is kind of the beginning, the, the germ, the seed of what emerges into the fully orbed Catholic understanding that Christ elevated uh, Christian marriage to the to the level of a sacrament because there's a promise of divine assistance to accomplish what God really intended something that was not possible under the Mosaic law um, and and when you go through the rest of the apostolic teaching on the nature of marriage uh, the full truth of this becomes evident so if you look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians in, in particular chapter 6 and 7 and Paul deals with matters of sexual ethics um, he anticipates the possibility that Christians might separate all right, and and cease to, to live conjugally. And he says, you must not divorce your wife, your wife must not divorce her husband. But then he says, but if she does, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. All right, so even when there is some kind of temporal separation, Paul anticipates no possibility of those people forming unions with anybody else. All right, kind of leaves the door open in case they were to reconcile later. Is no, he the insists idea? they reconcile. You sure, know, reconciliation is the is the is the you know is the is the norm. I mean, that's the right. expectation. All right, and uh, and there there are a couple other passages that are really interesting in this. One of them is um, uh, in chapter six. Saint Paul addresses the question of uh, prostitution. He says, "Don't unite yourself to a prostitute." All right, but don't you know when you unite yourself to a prostitute, you become one flesh with her? Right. If a Christian does this, he has he is uniting Christ, uniting the body of Christ to a prostitute. Now that's a remarkable statement. You know his his argument against prostitution. You you would expect him to say, well, prostitution is intrinsically immoral. You know, it's fornication. It's bad stuff. Don't do it. He doesn't actually put the argument that way. His whole argument is that it's a form of blasphemy if a Christian does it because he's implicating Christ himself in the act of, well, as it were, as it were, right, in the in the act of prostitute, you're mm -hmm. uniting the body of Christ to a prostitute. Don't you know you're one flesh with her, but you your body belongs to Christ, all right? So in virtue of our baptism, all right, we, we are identified with Christ so directly, it's mystical union with Christ, that our very bodies become members of his body, the church. That's why Christ could say to St. Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When you persecute the persons of my followers, he who hears you hears me. Okay, all right. And so, it, you, you think about that. Well, if that's the case between a Christian and a prostitute, what happens if you have two Christians, both of whose bodies have been united to Christ in baptism? Well, then, by definition, I mean it's 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 inescapable that their marital embrace implicates Christ in a very intimate way in the very act of sexual union within a Christian marriage. Now, the Catholic Church's position on the sacramentality of marriage is that if two baptized people marry, that union cannot but be sacramental. If they're validly married, it is of a ne it's of necessity a sacrament. Why? In virtue of their baptism, right, they've become identified with Christ. So you can't, there's no way to exclude him from that, right? And, and then there's a... It, so I can't. I can no longer speak of Christian marriage as a merely natural union. You see, because it's it's been supernaturalized 
in virtue of their uh, supernatural transformation, their participation in the divine nature conveyed through baptism. All right, so that's another kind of leg of the picture. Um, now, there is an instance in, uh, in the Corinthian correspondence where Paul doesn't just counsel but demands the man separate from a uh, quasi-conjugal relationship that he's taken on. And, and the instance is when there's a fellow who has taken his father's wife to bed, okay? Not his own mother, but seemingly his stepmother, right. okay? Now, there's no suggestion in the text that the father is still living. I mean, the, it, it, quite the contrary. It seems dad died, okay? And, and he doesn't address the question of whether or not this man sought to contract a uh, marriage with this woman or not, but that seems to be a, a, a rational inference, all right? So in other words, what's the crime here? You might say, well, it's not really incest because he's not biologically related to this woman, all right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, all right? Because in Mosaic law, when two people married, they became one flesh in more than a metaphorical way. And from that moment on, like the bond of marriage marks those people out and so bans on relationships within certain degrees of consanguinity, right? Would, or in other words, incest, uh, incest regulation would come into play, all right? So by marrying or taking to bed this woman who had previously been married to his father, this guy was actually in violation of those pornea statutes right, that Acts chapter 15 insisted had also to be imposed upon Gentiles. Mm. Right, that's an example of the kind of porneia that Paul says is absolutely unacceptable. All right, uh, it wasn't adultery, it was a violation of incest taboos in virtue of taking a woman that had previously been married to his mother.